Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with your stars, Aaron Eisenberg and Sirach Lofton. Sirach hello, Lofton hello. is, uh, well, he's just calling in right now because he's having technical difficulties. He's out in uh, Italy right now. Wow. Right, Brooke? And Italy, <laughs> Italy. But yes, it's close. Something like that. Italy, uh, Italy. But he's calling in, and we also have a special guest, Mr. Mark Zikri, who is a, a noted writer for many decades in sci-fi, Babylon 5, Star Trek, Sliders, He-Man, Smurfs, The Real Ghostbusters, uh, The Twilight Zone Companion, you name it, oh. he wrote it, unless you name stuff that he hasn't written. And uh, I'm Ryan T. Husk. Spice Channel? Did he write for the Spice Channel, Mark? Nope, not yet. Oh, nothing for the Spice Channel. Okay. <laughs> so we will be covering our uh, rewatch of Q-less, episode uh, number six of season one, Deep Space Nine. That's Q-less, directed by Paul Lynch. Uh, as you may have guessed, Q and Bosch make an exciting return. Uh, before we get into talking all about Mark, Mark Sickery and all things Space Man and Star Trek, Aaron, would you like to tell us a word from Trinity Comics? I would. Uh, I'm going to, before we begin that, ask if Sirach could mute his microphone. Can you do that for a sec, Sirach, but still hear us? Yeah, I'm, get, I'm trying to get to a quieter place, but yeah, I'll mute okay. it for you. Okay, thank you, sir. Go to Rome. Got it. Ooh. All right, <laughs> awesome. All right, here we go. Uh, Trinity Comics Convention Services attends over 30 comic conventions a year and has private signings with some of the biggest celebrities and comic creators in the world. They offer COAs and certification through CGC and CBCS. Make sure to visit them online at www.trinity-comics.com. Do not forget the hyphen. That might take you someplace that is not sponsoring our show. So we want to give a big thank you to Matt Saltzman and Trinity Comics for sponsoring our show. We, we truly appreciate your sponsorship. Great, dude. So now, Mr. Mark Zikri, where are you calling in from? Well, I'm calling in from the great Zikri mansion in the sky here in West Hollywood. And uh, that's, Wait, uh, is it in the sky or is it in West Hollywood? Oh, it's a dirigible, dirigible that's high, you know, basically uh, hovering above West Hollywood as it's Gosh. April. Wow, it's like Cloud City almost. Yeah, yeah. it's like that. <laughs> yeah, very much like that. So, uh, as we mentioned before, Mark Sikri is a noted writer and author. He wrote one of my favorite Next Generation episodes called First Contact, which had a really, really good and important message about when race is already for first contact and how, how mm. that would affect society if it actually hit our society. But that's for a later time. Well, we kind of talked a little bit about that the other day. We did, and I mentioned We had a little Zikri. debate about that. Yeah. Yes, so, we did. On Deep Space Nine, Mr. Mark Zikri wrote a little episode that some people consider to be the best Deep Space Nine episode called Far Beyond the Stars. Here it is right here. There's oh, yeah. Mr. Hooray. Mark with the- uh, Look at that, episode. Mark. It's fun. It's fun. It's the most boring set photo ever. I mean, that's actually a set. That's not a, an office. But <laughs> if you didn't know Deep Space Nine, if you know Deep Space Nine, that's a terrific photo. But if you don't, you think, well, why is he just hanging out with these people in suits? It looks like, you know, uh, the meeting of the Shriners or something. <laughs> this is true because we've been sharing photos from Deep Space Nine, the seasons, and a lot of them just aren't very good, Mark. Uh, <laughs> we were overexposed. Some people look sinister. <laughs> like Ciroc, yeah. Yeah, like Ciroc. Yeah, Some look yeah. like they're like struggling to be in the photo. It's really funny. It's really <laughs> funny. So this is actually a really good one for Deep Space Nine. <laughs> so tell us uh, kind of where, where your idea came from. Like, were you just kind of like driving one day and you thought, wouldn't it be cool if, were you inspired by something or someone you saw when you came up with Far Beyond the Stars? Or were yeah. you just watching Deep Space Nine and said, you know, I would love to see all these brilliant <laughs> actors out of makeup? Well, it was it was a number of different things that, that led to the, uh, the inspiration. Basically, I grew up with Star Trek. I was a huge Star Trek fan. It had a great influence on me. And Star Trek, Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, those were the three shows that made me want to be a writer. And so as soon as I was old enough, when I was a teenager, I started going to science fiction conventions and meeting the writers who wrote for those shows. And one of my mentors was Theodore Sturgeon. 
And when I, know, when I knew Ted Sturgeon, he had written two great original Star Trek episodes, Shore Leave and Amok Time. He was also a renowned uh, science fiction writer in novels and short stories. And when I knew him, he was living in Silver Lake in this little converted laundry room. It wasn't even a, an apartment per se. And, and yet he had his Hugo and Nebula awards on the mantle. And, and, I, and he was very impoverished. And, uh, and I realized that, the, that the, the people who were gods to me, who were writing the science fiction that I grew up with, we're writing for five cents a word, a penny a word mm. for astounding in Galaxy magazine. And there wouldn't be a Star Trek, there wouldn't be a Star Wars if not for these amazing writers like Ted Sturgeon, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, Harlan Ellison, who wrote for those pulp magazines because they loved science fiction. They were they, they were writing for the love of it. And they were creating a future that led to the moon landings, that led to Martin Luther King, um, you know, when he did, gives the mountaintop speech, he's basically telling a science fiction story. He's talking about a future that doesn't yet exist, but in the telling of it, he helps to create it. And so I wanted to pay tribute to those amazing writers back then in the 1950s, writing for the science fiction magazines. And and um, so I pitched it to, and, uh, and also by, by the time DS9 debuted, I was friends with Armin Shimmerman, uh, I'd written from when when we were both working on Beauty and the Beast, uh, mm -hmm. the Ron Perlman series, mm -hmm. but uh, we really became friends once Deep Space Nine was up and running. And I thought it would be really fun to see all the actors out of makeup, to see them as they really looked, because fans of of Quark, fans of Odo, etc., uh, you know, they they didn't know what these people looked like, and it was ironic because Armin, of course, was also a regular on Buffy at the same time as the principal. And people would recognize him from that, but you know, wouldn't recognize from him from DS9. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it'd be great fun to be able to show that. And then uh, once we got into conversation with the rest of the writing staff, the question was then how to, you know, make the story relevant and powerful. And we started talking about the whole issue of Cisco going back as a black science fiction writer and not being able to write the truth of the future that he envisioned and, and having to write about a future that was only white people. And, and ultimately coming to where he had to write his truth mm. of the world he lived in and the world he could see moving forward, the world that became the Deep, Deep Space Nine universe. And, um, and that was very exciting to all of us. Ron Moore, um, uh, Ira Bear, Hans Beimler, everyone who was part of that incredible writing staff, we all knew this was going to be a classic episode before we even wrote it. And wow. so, I wrote, so I wrote the outline. And I also, interestingly enough, Harlan Ellison, who wrote City on the Edge of Forever and was very down on Star Trek, he was also a friend, and he'd done a great cassette where he talked about writing for the pulp magazines, and that was another inspiration for Far Beyond the Stars. And so when I was writing the outline, uh, at that time I was also a producer at, on Sliders, so I was writing scripts for Sliders and working on these, these nine at the same time. And uh, so when I was working on the outline, I actually called Harlan and asked him a lot of questions, specific questions about writing back then, and if he knew any black writers who were writing under white pseudonyms, and he said, not in science fiction, but there was one mainstream writer he knew who was. And, and also one of my teachers at Clarion, the Clarion, Clarion Writers Workshop was Samuel R. Delaney, who was one of the first great black science fiction writers. And so again, I, all of this kind of was grist for the mill. And because I knew science fiction, the history of science fiction so well, I have my own science fiction channel now called Mr. Sci-Fi, where I talk about science fiction perspective. But because I knew that history so well, I was really able to pour all of that into Far Beyond the Stars, and I, and I was thrilled. And they were actually shooting one of my Sliders episodes the same week they were shooting my DS9 episode. So I actually got a photo of myself with the, with both casts the same day with me in the same wow. crew. So that was uh, pretty phenomenal. It was it was amazing to go on the set and watch watch them shooting Far Beyond the Stars. Now was you, it? Oh, go, go ahead. ahead, Aaron. Go ahead. I I just wanted to ask uh, as as since we're talking about the building up of this episode, wasn't it originally the idea, or I, I believe yours, if I read it correctly, to be centered around uh, Jake Cisco, Sirox's yeah. character? Yes, originally yes, and and wow. the, and the and the rationale for why it was happening was different, and but then when we sat down with staff. The idea that it was all sort of like a, 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 a hallucination from the prophets or a dream or whatever, that's something as a freelancer you could never pitch because you can't pitch and they wake up and it's all just a dream. I mean, that mm -hmm. can never work. So I had, as a freelancer, I had a different rationale. But the moment we started talking about the show and everyone knew I'd written The Twilight Zone Companion, they all owned it. They were all huge fans of The Twilight Zone. And so Ron Moore, when we were sitting around at lunch at Nicodell's, uh, working on the storyline, uh, Ron said, well, we want this as much as possible to be like a Twilight Zone episode, and it really is. It's really very different from Deep Space Nine. We all knew that it was going to expand 
what Star Trek was, that there had never been a Star Trek episode that spoke overtly about race. There, had been, there was never a Star Trek character, one of the lead characters saying, I'm a black person. And, and they'd, done, they'd done the interracial kiss with Michelle Nichols. They'd done the half white, black, half white thing with, with Frank Gorish. And, but this was the first time in Star Trek that a character, one of our lead characters, like Uhura never said, I'm a black woman on any of the original Star Trek episodes. Here we have Cisco saying, I'm, I'm a, or, or Cisco's character back in the 50s saying, I'm a black man, I'm a human being. And this had such resonance. And when I saw it last year at the Star Trek convention, when we screened it, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jake gets murdered by the cops. I mean, when and when you think of that in terms of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, this is more relevant now than when we when we shot it back then. 